Hello everyone! So today I wanted to talk a little bit about brands that have changed. Mostly brands that have changed in a negative way, but a couple of brands that have changed in a positive way. This is a topic that I have seen and heard mentioned over and over and over again, and usually it's just sort of glossed over. People don't really talk about anything specific. So I wanted to delve in a little further and just give my two cents on what I think happened. So the first brand I want to talk about is Colourpop. So Colourpop was only founded in 2014, although it seems like they've been around forever. But my big question with Colourpop is, where did the colour go? I remember hearing about Colourpop a couple of years ago, and I specifically remember bright and unusual colours in their eyeshadow, their Super Shock eyeshadows, as well as their eyeliners and some unusual lipstick colours. And I remember thinking how cool it was to see a very affordable brand, at least in the US, has these cool, unique products. Stuff that I felt like was missing from the beauty community as a whole, like at least in terms of affordable options from what I had explored and missing from my own collection as well. So I remember looking at this before I ordered because the Colourpop went through a couple of phases at the very beginning when they first launched. It was very, very expensive to ship to Canada, as is normal for a lot of American brands. They've since lowered their shipping costs and made it easier to purchase from there. So that's a very good thing. But what happened to the colour? Everything that was really bright and colourful has all seemed to have been discontinued. And whenever they come out with new products, they might have one or two colourful things, but usually they get discontinued pretty darn quick. The good thing about Colourpop is that they are pretty quick to produce stuff and because of the lower price point there's not a lot of product there but that means that if you get bored of the trend you're not going to have a lot of waste. I think of Colourpop sort of like Forever 21 which is you know fairly inexpensive fast fashion stuff that you might wear that's trendy for a little while and then if you get bored of it or the trends change you really aren't out a lot of money and that's really what Colourpop seems like to me but one thing that I've noticed is that they've partnered a lot more with influencers and even various other celebrities and those collaborations tend to be neutral all around neutral very safe colors every now and then there's an exception but a lot of the stuff I notice, it's like nude lipsticks, maybe some reds, you know, very safe colors that sell. And it's smart because people are going to buy stuff because of those collaborations, but it's not anything very interesting. And Colourpop has sort of fallen off my radar a little bit recently because when I see these new releases come out, everything kind of looks the same. It looks like they're repackaging stuff over and over and over again and it just has gotten a little bit old. So my main theory about what happened with Colourpop and where did the colour go is that the neutrals sold, the safe stuff sold. That's what made them really popular. Despite their name being Colourpop, a lot of people are more interested in buying those safe everyday sort of colours. So while it's disappointing for more adventurous makeup users, it definitely makes sense from a business standpoint. It's still disappointing and I do hope that they will embrace their name a little bit more and introduce some more colourful things in the future. The second brand I want to talk about is Urban Decay. So they were founded in 1996 and they were totally the epitome of 90s cool girl. Just every cool 90s person who wore makeup had Urban Decay. Everything I've read about from Urban Decay's history, it was just such a cool underground brand. I remember reading about it in some of my teen magazines, but I used to read between like 2000 and 2005-ish. I need to find them somewhere because oh, I just loved those things so much and there was so much inspiration in them. But I remember seeing that old Urban Decay packaging in those magazines, it was always labeled as cool girl makeup. It was just a little bit edgy with their packaging, they were risque, they pushed the envelope with their uh, product names using a lot of like sexual references and drug references and it was just something that was so cool and appealed to a lot of younger people 
and somewhere along the way Urban Decay lost that. They've lost their edge a little bit, uh, or maybe a lot. Urban Decay was sold to L'Oreal in 2013, and that I definitely see corresponding with how they shifted away from what they were known for. They definitely became less cool and more about consumption and how can we produce more that people will want. I think that's really when we saw the naked palettes really take off and there was just less of a cool factor there with Urban Decay. Lately it seems like they're pandering a little bit to people and they're producing stuff that doesn't really seem very cohesive or very successful. A lot of stuff when it comes out it ends up in the sales section a couple of months later. We've seen that with influencer collaborations, we've seen this with a variety of different Urban Decay products. It's kind of this running joke now where if somebody talks about buying something from Urban Decay that's new people are like I'll oh, just wait a couple of months because it'll be on sale. And it's really true but some of the stuff that they come out with is just not good. The quality is not good. You hear a lot of people saying good things about certain products when they are on the PR list. This is something that I seem to notice with the Backtalk palette in particular. I just don't know how people could say good things about it. It just was not up to Urban Decay standards from stuff they'd used before and yet you still had certain people saying it was good. It was definitely kind of questionable but they keep coming out with things that don't really excite people and people end up doing like the same look. I saw it with the Beachy palette which was like one part naked heat with a couple of blue shades so everybody was doing the orangey red lid and the blue lower lash line or like a blue smoky eye. <laughs> That's just what everybody was doing. Everybody was doing the exact same thing with that palette and I don't really hear a lot of people talk about it anymore. They've recently come out with a new one the what adventure theme palette, I'm not even sure what it's called, but it just, it's a repackaged vice palette. That really is what it is. It's not labeled a vice, there's a few more shadows than are normally in the vice palette, so people are like, oh my god, look at this. The packaging is so tacky. I love it personally, I'm a very tacky person, but it's so far removed from the edgy Urban Decay personality. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you compare that to some of the older products that Urban Decay used to sell and some of the stuff that they seem to be discontinuing. I've heard a rumor that they're discontinuing the Naked Basics palette. I'm not happy about that if that is true because that is one of the best neutral eyeshadow palettes. I think, you know, Urban Decay does mattes pretty well. So anyway I just think they've made some mistakes along the way and I think that they could really get in now on the early 2000s stuff that's starting to make a comeback because Urban Decay was such a big brand then. People talked about Urban Decay a lot. I think that if they really started to bring back some of their old products that people still remember from those early days, the early 2000s, they could get their image back. They could they could do it. They could do it. So I still have hope. The third brand is Makeup Geek and that was founded in 2011 and Marlena is just one of the OG beauty gurus. I think sometimes people forget that Makeup Geek had its start in YouTube and that it was one of the first, if not the very first brands that was founded by an influencer. And I think that when it started, it was amazing and Marlena did such a good job. But one of the selling features of Makeup Geek was that it was a better quality than MAC for less price. So people felt like they were getting a really good deal. I do have some Makeup Geek stuff myself. I think the quality is phenomenal. But what happened is that MAC lowered their prices and some of Makeup Geek's prices actually went up. And I don't think people were too happy about that. From what I've read, the consumer reaction was not great. Makeup Geek started to come out with products that were at a much higher price point than before and I think that really shocked consumers. I don't think it went over well. I'm thinking specifically of like the highlighters which were more at least high-end drugstore but like low-end sort of like Sephora prices. If I remember correctly they were about like $20-ish a piece. That's fairly expensive especially going from $6 eyeshadow pans. So I think that there was a bit of a separation with consumers there but also because Makeup Geek is pretty much 
purely an online brand. I know they've recently started to sell at Target. I'm not sure if they sell in Target or not. There's no Targets here anyway in Canada anymore. That was an, that was another fail. Uh, so I don't have any experience like going to a store and seeing if they're in there. I know they're available online, so I think that might help Makeup Geek a little bit. But unfortunately, a lot of influencers and social media people have stopped talking about Makeup Geek. And just a theory I have, I think it really coincides with Morphe, with Makeup Geek not having affiliate codes, not having the same sort of program like Morphe does. You know, we've all heard about the Morphe code pushers. Now, I know a lot of people dislike that, but I think that would be something that would help Makeup Geek because then those influencers and social media people have a reason to talk about the brand and they're not going to promote a brand that doesn't benefit them, unfortunately. I noticed it back in the day because a lot of the people that I watched started to push Morphe and other brands that they had affiliations with as opposed to brands that they did not. And that seems to be a common occurrence. People want to get something out of it, which makes sense. It sucks for consumers and, and everyday people kind of trying to get information on what to buy. So I am curious to see what direction Makeup Geek is going to go in next. They had the power pigments recently, those bright colorful eyeshadows, which didn't really seem to take off like I kind of thought they would because it was so cool to see these bright, interesting colors. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what comes next. And I have one more brand I want to talk about that has changed in somewhat of a negative way, and that is NYX. So NYX was founded in 1999, which kind of surprised me when I looked that up. I thought they were a much more recent brand. But they started as a company that would sell sort of high-end professional makeup at drugstore prices. And I think what has happened recently is that NYX has really started to move away from the drugstore pricing. At the drugstore, particularly in Canada, NYX is very expensive. I see a lot of people avoid the NYX section just because some of the things are so expensive. They're priced so high that it sort of takes people out of the, oh, I'll just pick up a mascara or a new lipstick when they go, ooh, this thing's $14, don't think so. I'll buy this one that's six. So it just makes a huge difference that way. Uh, I don't think that this happened for no reason. NYX was sold to L'Oreal in 2014 for 500 million dollars. So I think that absolutely had something to do with it. Uh, you see NYX with their face awards, they're constantly giving away boxes and boxes of products to influencers. You see people using the products all of the time. I feel like they really are such a good artistry based brand, but they need to either move out of the drugstore if they're going to continue to raise their prices or they need to stabilize, potentially lower their prices. Because I know some of the stuff is absolutely ridiculous. They had a vault of liquid lipsticks and in Canada they were selling it for over $100. It was just nuts. The price of some of these things that they thought was like drugstore friendly, which really is not. And I know everything's going up in price, but sometimes it's way too much and it causes that disconnect, which seems to turn off the everyday person. And I am talking about myself here too, because when I go to the drugstore, I tend to avoid NYX stuff just because I know it's so much more expensive compared to the other things at the drugstore. If it was sold somewhere else, I feel like my perception would change a little bit and I would be more understandable. At the drugstore, you kind of have a cutoff. You know, there's that price point that you're like, this is where the drugstore should be and it should not be higher than this. And when you start seeing eyeshadow palettes that are like $30, you know, contour palettes and stuff that are $30, it's like, that's a little much. Now, there are two brands that I think have changed in a really good way. And the first one is a drugstore brand. It's Wet n Wild. Wet n Wild was founded in New York in 1979 and they were known for selling 99 cent lipstick and nail polishes. And I feel like they have really held true to that. They are still the cheap side of the drugstore, but the quality of the products have improved tremendously. Instead of just it being sort of the intro makeup, where a lot of people are like, hmm, I'm trying to get into makeup and I'm gonna buy the cheapest thing possible. This is some of the cheapest stuff possible, but 
actually performs really well. They've made changes to their branding, to their packaging. Stuff looks more expensive, but they didn't drastically raise their prices. Some of the stuff went up maybe by a dollar or two as opposed to like five or ten dollars. There was a lot of times when I was younger that the brand I bought from was Wet n Wild. They used to have such a cool assortment of weird lipsticks. I remember buying black lipstick back in like 2004 at the drugstore <laughs> Wet n Wild. So I feel like they've really held true to their image, but they've just managed to upgrade it. They've really had that glow up, so to speak. And I've just really been impressed with the way that Wet n Wild has grown. And they've even been able to come out with some pretty cool collections, which is not something you see all the time at the drugstore. So that's been, it's really cool just to see these different things. They had the goth graphic one, they had the spring one with like the little hummingbird print on there. It's just like some cute stuff. I hope they don't go overboard and be too trendy. I feel like they could end up veering too far into the constant collection rotation, sort of like with MAC, which gets old really fast. I'd rather they had just a couple of collections because it gets people interested and brings people back to the brand as long as the quality stays good. So anyway, I just think Wet n Wild is one of those brands that has managed to change in a good way. They're not exactly where they started from. They've just ended up in a better place. And the last brand who has changed in a very positive way is Anastasia of Beverly Hills. So the brand itself was founded in 1997. They started to sell like brow products in 2000. It wasn't until 2014 that they started to sell color cosmetics though, which is kind of shocking because Anastasia is probably one of the biggest makeup brands in the world right now. I think almost everybody who wears makeup knows at least something about Anastasia. Usually if you're talking about brows, people know Dip Brow or Brow Wiz. Those are products that even people who are just sort of casually into makeup know. They know Anastasia, they know brows, and I just think it's cool that that's where they started, but they ended up doing so much in such a short amount of time, and they've really become trendsetters. A lot of people look to see what Anastasia is coming out with. What are they doing next? They've really managed to change a lot when it comes to things like the Modern Renaissance palette. You're getting people into these more berry tones that they weren't using before when it was really really difficult to find like orange and red eyeshadows really easily. It seems crazy now because there's just an abundance of them but there really was a time where you it was almost impossible to track down reds and oranges and those really bright pigmented warm colors. And just just the Modern Renaissance palette has become such a staple product. It's one of the things people recommend to beginners all the time. Um, they recently came out with the Soft Glam palette, which is another good beginner's palette. They did end up running into controversy with subculture, but that color scheme was so needed. We so needed a break from that. You have their highlighter palettes, they've done contour palettes, they have foundation sticks, they've got pretty much everything that you would want for a full face of makeup and that's incredible considering that it was all produced within a relatively short amount of time. They've really sort of taken over the beauty industry and they've managed to revolutionize a lot of stuff just by starting trends instead of following them. And it's they're one of the brands that I find the most exciting because they're always doing new things. And I'm always excited when I hear like some new Anastasia thing came out because I know it's going to be something interesting. Even if it doesn't appeal to me personally, I know it's going to be something good. So anyway, that is all I have to say. I just really wanted to explore this topic a little bit more and I would love to hear from you. What are some of your theories? Why do you think some of these brands have changed for the better or changed for worse or do you completely disagree with me altogether? I would love to hear whatever you're thinking. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead of you and I hope we get a chance to chat soon. Bye for now.